And we are live. Welcome to the Urban Christian Institute broadcast. I'm your host, MJ Jackson, and this is episode one of season one. I'm kind of sort of the new kid on the block. Uh, some of you guys are probably like, who is this guy, MJ? And what is he doing? What is he up to? What is this organization, the Urban Christian Institute? Well, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit about it, a little bit of observation, what kind of birthed this uh, this organization. Over the last, uh, the last two decades, an alarming uh, number of millennials who profess to be Christians have exited the church due to many things. Um, number one false teaching in the church. Number two, exposure to anti-Christian teaching by real cults that call into question the reliability of the historic Christian Orthodox teaching and of what the scripture teach. In other words, they question the historicity, the, excuse me, the historicity of Christianity and also throw shade at the Christian scriptures. Um, and number three, primary, uh, primarily a failure on the part of urban churches to answer these objections with solid biblical, scholarly, and logical answers. Right on. It's due to these, uh, due to these facts that many have walked away from the faith altogether. And what has been the response largely by the urban Christian churches? Hmm. Here's the answer. The urban churches, not all but some, have continued to perform with uh, what I would like to call Sunday morning showcases, uh, midweek pick-me-up services. When, when was the last time? I can't say everybody. But when was the last time you actually went to a Bible study where you actually studied the Bible. I mean, really de delve deep into it, studied the, the, you know, how it was, how it came together, how God brought everything together and also even the contents of it right on. So you got these midweek pick me up services, these conferences where you have the prophets and, and these evangelists and the apostles. And I don't have a problem with the fivefold. But these conferences and these holy convocations, more of all this is happening, many of the millennials have continued to plunge into the depths of hell at an alarming rate by turning to various other religions and cults which have launched an attack for the minds of our young people, both in the church and in the urban communities. These cults and other religions have presented their case as the solution to the problems for the young people afforded to them by society and possibly a church who has been asleep at the wheel. I want to tell whoever's listening that a new day is dawning for God is raising up voices who will make up the hedge and stand in the gap. He's raising up voices like my man, Adam Coleman. He's raising up voices like, uh, good guy named Vocal Malone. If you ever get a chance, look both Adam Coleman of True ID, that's T-R-U-I-D, and also look up Vocal Malone. They have some excellent content. Look up my man K-Dub, and I think that's K-Dub, T-R-U. Check them out. You can also check out Dr. Eric Mason. You can check out my man Damon Richardson. He's raising up all these voices. He, he's raising them up to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. And these are the voices who are who are giving answers for people who are who who are truly looking for the truth. I want to tell you something here at, at the Urban Christian Institute. Don't let that name throw you off. <laughs> we seek to equip ministers. We seek to equip ministries, leaders, family, and young people with the tools necessary to combat these ideologies, these worldviews and false teachings. 
Furthermore, we believe that having these tools is of the utmost importance for the hour that we are living in. And that they will help to uproot false teaching that are both historically false and not rooted in biblical truth. It's my hope that the Urban Christian Institute can provide support on a biblical, philosophical, and historical level to deconstruct false teachings, y'all. That's what we it's what we're gonna be trying to do. We want to deconstruct those false worldviews that will seek to bleed and destroy the the church. And it's also my hope to do my part in helping to train soldiers in the Lord's army that will always be ready to give an answer for the hope that they have within them. That's first Peter 315. Lord willing, we hope to do this through the use of uh podcasts like this that you're listening to. We also hope to do it through seminars, webinars, web broadcasts, blogs, street ministries, and Lord willing, other formats, even within the local church. So that's a little bit of a, uh, of a mission statement. So, yeah, it's the Urban Christian Institute. It's pretty new. We're rolling. And we thank God for every opportunity that we get. And uh, I'd like to just start off with that. And I, once again, I'm your host, MJ Jackson. And uh, some of the things that I would hope to, to get into is to take a look at what's come to be known as the conscious community. The conscience community. There has been a uh, pretty much a movement that has been going for quite some time now. And I guess due to the fact that the Internet makes everything available has kind of really come to the forefront. You do have your Hebrew Israelites. You do have your nation of Islam. You do have all these other ideologies, uh, pretty much these uh, identity uh, movements and religions and ideologies, and even we can even classify them as cults. You do have all those, but uh, it's, it's of my opinion that the uh, conscious community, the committed community, whatever they would like to be called, hoteps, all that good stuff, uh, they're unique in the sense that they don't necessarily have uh, or claim to be a religion, but moreover, they claim to 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 be a uh, to be conscience aware, awoke, or if I can use that word, um, trying to um, know thyself, so to speak, as uh, Doctor Akbar has so eloquently put it in one of his books called "Know Thyself." Naim Akbar, one of his books. So you got this ideology uh, of knowing yourself. And if we could use a technical term, and we're talking about a theory of knowledge that comes through the self and the self that tries to trace its roots back to uh, to traditional um, African culture. In other words, uh, as my man Adam Coleman put it, I don't know if he's the first to use it, but but I heard him use it, so I'm gonna give him a little credit for it. Uh, we have what we have here is cultural epistemology, uh, cultural epistemology, and epistemology, which is what the philosophers call a theory of knowledge. In other words, uh, they try to gain uh, what's true by filtering everything through the culture, so to speak, and what, you know, and, and in other words, what's, what's consistent with the culture is ultimately truth. And in focusing in on, um, on this group, I wanted to kind of sort of deal with some of the, uh, some of the pillars, uh, the scholars, because they do have books. I don't think I don't necessarily think uh, a lot of the people writing for the conscious community produce really good books, but they do have some scholars that are well respected 
kind of like your uh your Dr. Ben uh Yakinen, uh if I pronounced it right, and you have your John Henrik Clark, and you have uh guys like the fella that I'm gonna focus on, John G. Jackson. And within this uh broadcast, backslash podcast, I want to focus in on John G. Jackson. The reason why I have selected to focus in on some of the works of John G. Jackson is for one, he is so gracious enough to put a bibliography that he actually cites in his book. And I, I really respect that because he's not hiding anything from his readers. So, he, you know, he tries to be scholarly uh, with his approach and uh, he tries to, you know, support um, some of his findings with documentation. He tries to document and tries to prove it in a scholarly fashion. Uh, I'm flipping through his book, so if it sounds a little noisy, I apologize. But I just want to tell you a little bit about John G. Jackson. And I'm not going to be uh, beyond long, but uh, I wanted to just kind of allow everybody to get, they, uh, get their beak wet and uh, also for myself to get my feet wet because I'm going to be doing this on a regular basis, at least twice a month, maybe once a month. Lord willing. But let me tell you a little about John G. Jackson. John G. Jackson was an educator, a lecturer, an author, uh, and a man of principle. He was born on April the 1st, 1907, into a family of Methodists. It says, as he remembers now, he has been an atheist. Okay, now this man is a flat-out atheist, since he could think. The family minister once asked him when he was small, who made you? After some thought, he replied from his own realization, I don't know. He lived for 50 years in the New York City, 1932 to 1977, lecturing at the Ingersoll Forum of American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. And he did that from 1930 to 1955. During the parallel period, he wrote articles for the Truth Seeker magazine. He was at the same time a writer and associate of Rationalist Press Association in London, England from 1932 to 1972. Beginning in 1971, he became a lecturer in the Black Studies Department of Rutgers University, remaining there until 1973. From 1973 to 1977, he was visiting professor, what we would call a junk professor, at the University of New York. When he moved to Chicago, he quickly became a junk professor at Northeast Illinois University. From 1977 to 1980, one of the courses which he taught was comparative religion. His approach to that course was such <laughs> that the university officials cautioned him to be more discreet. Yeah. Another of his courses dealt with social movements. Jackson was an ever consistent friend of labor and was a member of the UAW. All right, UAW. I'm a part of UAW as well. Uh, District 65 AFL CIO for most of his life. His books include Introduction to African Civilization. A Guide to the Study of African History, Ethiopia, and the Origin of Civilization, Man, God, and Civilization, and his best-selling Pagan Origins of the Christ Man. And for the purposes of the work that we're going to be doing with Mr. John G. Jackson, we're going to be dealing with that last book mentioned, The Pagan Origins of the Christ Myth. And the book currently that I have in my hand, Christianity Before Christ. And if uh, if possible, we'll go a couple of chapters at a time, maybe one chapter at a time, maybe three chapters condensed down at a time and kind of sort of deal with this thing from the foundation. Okay. So... Why John G. Jackson? And I told you, he's a scholar amongst uh, 
amongst this community, but also even even just having conversations at you know the barber shop, you'll come into contact with some of the information that he has put out there. For instance, when when he opens up his book in chapter one, he's dealing with the creation of the world and of man. Now he starts off dealing with Archbishop James Usher. Uh, and he's really dealing with the date, how some people believe, uh, some Christians believe in a young earth. Truth be told, the Bible does not, uh, it does not force a person to take a young earth or old earth position. So I'm going to just kind of move on beyond that. But that's the truth of the matter is. Nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, it gets into a little bit more, so to speak, within this first chapter. Now, I'm going to just tell you a little story. I remember when I got into a little bit of a barbershop debate, and <laughs> that's where it goes down for me. It, it probably goes down for a whole lot of other people at the barbershop, maybe even at barbecues. But it went down for me at the barbershop where I was confronted um, by a, you know, my barber's coworker. And I think that we, you know, somehow, some way we got on the black Hebrew Israelites, and somebody had mentioned that they were a cult. And uh, the brother looked over at me and he said, Well, you know, he was trying to get under my skin. You know, Christianity's a cult. I said, How so? And from there, he went from there to, uh, to the assertion that, well, you know, there's two, two creation stories. That book is made up, blah, 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 something like that. So I took my time to, to really try to get him to uh, enunciate or to clarify why he thought there was two creation stories within the Bible. And a lot of times when you're dealing with these groups, you're, you're dealing with uh, what we like to call people who parrot information. Okay. The biggest thing is in, in, in the scholarly world, when, when somebody says that you're dealing with the JEDP, uh, the JEDP theory. Okay. I'll break that down for a moment. But if I would have came out and said that to him, he wouldn't have had a clue what I was talking about. Nevertheless, let's look at uh, uh, one of the, of the, of course, the, this whole assertion originates with the JEDP theory, which is comparative religion, all that good stuff. Moreover, it has came into the urban or African-American community, okay, uh, by some of Mr. John G. Jackson's work. And I just want to read a little bit of his uh, book out of the first chapter. And he, here it is. And he's quoting somebody. Make sure y'all can hear me. And he says, during the Middle Ages, the Christian God was anthropomorphic, as Professor White observed. Okay. So he's honing in on some anthropomorphic language. Okay. But as he gets past the anthropomorphic language, John G. Jackson asserts there are two stories of the creation, here it is, of man in Genesis one in chapter one, one in chapter two. These two accounts flatly contradict each other. And this has created a problem for true believers. Uh, has it really created a problem? For true believers. I know I'm a believer. I know I'm a true believer. Spirit filled, blood bought, saint of God. Amen. And 
he says, we learn from the first three verses of Genesis chapter one, that after God had created the heavens and earth, he gave command, let there be light. And there was light. Then the light was called day and darkness called night. Didn't complete the first day of work. Second day is work. And I'm reading kind of fast was the creation of the ferment in the third day. Now you got to read closely what this brother is saying. You also have to have your Bible open just to fact check these brothers because they will pull a quick one on you because they are, they have already presupposed that it cannot be true. That is false. So they already, they're, they're, they're looking for something. In other words, they are already set in their presuppositions. Okay. And let's skip down. Of course, you know, on the seventh day, God rested. Let's skip down. He says, in the first narrative, God is said to have created the lower animals first and then later on human beings, both male and female. He says, in the second account, we are told that God created man first and the lower animals next. In the first story, the creator begins with the fishes, then produces in turn birds and beasts, and finally, woman. In the second tale, man comes first, then God makes the lower animals, and finally, woman. He says the most noticeable points of difference between the two cosmogenies are one, in the first, the earth emerged from the waters and was hence saturated with moisture in the set with moisture. In the second, the whole face of the ground required moisture. In. Okay. So let's take a little look real quick. Because he's uh he's alleging some, you know, some things such as a contradiction. So let's just take a look. And I'm pretty sure he's citing one and six. Then God said, let the, let there be waters and expanse between the water, separating the water from the water. And let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and gathered in the water. He called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation. Okay. Nowhere in that text does it say, that the earth emerged out of the water. Okay, that's one. So don't, let's not assume things that are not in the text. Two, so, uh, John G. Jackson says in the first, the birds and the beasts were created before man. In the second, man was created before the birds and the beasts. Okay, so we'll come right back to that one. Because I'm going to allow Dr. Gleason Archer to answer that one. But he says in the first, the birds and the beasts were created before man. And the second man was created before the birds and the beasts. And I'll explain the difference between Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Still one narrative, nevertheless, is written in the ancient Near Eastern style that I have to go into a little bit more detail about. But. Let's let's look at his point number three. He says in the first, all the flying fowl were made from the waters. In the second, the flying fowl in the air were made out of the ground. Oh, this is the one that I, when I was reviewing his book at work, this is the one where I just wanted to scream. All right, and I wrote a little note down. Okay, so let's let's read what it says. Let's read exactly what it says. Here it is. Here it is. Mm -hmm. And we're on, we're in Genesis one and verse 20. Then God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. Okay. Hold on for a second. John G. Jackson said in the first all the flying fowl were made from the waters. Okay, let me read it again. Then God said, let the water swarm 
with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. Now, does it say, let the waters create birds? Or does it say, let the water, meaning the destination or the uh, habitation, swarm with living creatures? Okay. And as far as the birds, in other words, let the birds fly above the earth. Let the birds inhabit above the earth. It didn't. It, there is no. It doesn't say that they were created out of the water. Once again, uh, what we have here is uh, something that's ad hoc. Uh, the assertion is not there. You know, the, it's pretty much a straw man here if we can use that term, okay? But let's look at number four, and I'm getting ready to come back to number two, his assertion number two, and I'm gonna kind of end it on that note. But let's look at number four. He says the in the first, talking about the first chapter, the man was made in the image of God. In the second chapter, man was made from the dust, then the animals, excuse me, then animated with the breath of life, after eating the forbidden fruit, the first human pair, the Lord said, Behold, the man has become one of us to know good and evil. Okay. So, to sum it up, the discrepancies point out above, and this is, this is ultimately his logical conclusion. He said, The discrepancies pointed out above are due to the fact that the first and the second account were taken from different documents. In the first narrative, the creator is called Elohim, God, whereas in the second narrative, he is called Jehovah Elohim. In other words, Lord God. The fact was well expressed by Frazier. In other words, it's back to what I told you earlier about that JEDP theory. Uh, Probably on the next episode, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the JEDP theory. Uh, but what I want to say here is he did say it was taken from two different documents. I would ask, okay, where are those documents? Do we have, uh, you, do we have those documents today? And can anybody produce those documents? That's one. But he brought up a charge and uh, point number number two. And, and, and basically, the assertion is we got two different creation stories. No way around it. Not getting away from it. It's a discrepancy. You got people. Mo In other words, Moses couldn't have wrote the book of Genesis because we got different information. I would like to go to a capable scholar. And just for anybody listening out there, look, it does you no good to only read and listen to people who you agree with. And it does you no good to pretend that Christians are not able to answer these simple assertions to pretend that Christians have no answers at all. The simple fact of the matter is Christians have always had answers. The sad part about it is that we in the urban community have uh, have slept at the wheel, but we thank God for waking us up. So let's see what, uh, what uh, Gleason Archer has to say. And this is out of his book. The Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, an excellent resource. I encourage you to get it if you can. And he's answering the assertion, doesn't Genesis 2 present a different creation order than Genesis 1? And I'm just going to read a little bit out of it, then I'm going to let you go to sleep. But uh, in short, he says, Genesis 2 does not present a creation account at all. Oh, there it is. This is not presenting a creation account at all. Genesis 1 is, but Genesis 2 is not presenting a creation account, but presupposes the completion of God's work of creation as set forth in chapter 1. 
the first three verses of Genesis 2 simply carry carry the narrative of chapter 1 to its final and logical conclusion. Let's just read uh, the first three verses just to give you kind of sort of an idea of what he's talking about. He says the first three verses carries the narrative of Genesis 1 to its logical conclusion. Okay. <laughs> Check it out. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed on the seventh day, and God had completed his work that that he had done and rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work. Mm -hmm. Those are the first three verses. Using the same, and this is Gleason Archer, he says, using the same vocabulary and style as employed in the previous chapter, it sets forth the completion of the whole primal work of creation and the special sanctity conferred on the seventh day, a symbol and memorial of God's creative work. Mm -hmm. Look at verse four. Verse four then sums up the whole sequence that has just been surveyed by saying, these are the generation. Okay, it's summing up the whole sequence. These are the generations of heaven and earth when they were created in the day that, that Yahweh God made the heaven and earth, having finished the overall survey of the subject. The author then develops in detail one important feature that has already been mentioned, the creation of man. All right. Check out what Dr. K.A which a lot of people know him, but his name is Kenneth. Check out what Dr. Kenneth Kitchen says. Genesis 1 mentions the creation of man as the last of a series and without any details. There are no details of man in Genesis 1, whereas Genesis 2, man is the center of interest and more specific details are given about him and his setting. A failure to recognize the complementary nature of the subject distinction between the skeleton outline of all creation on one hand and the concentration and detail of man on the other hand in his immediate environment borders on obscuritism. You got to be able to see that and you got to be able to think. You, unless you already come to the Bible with an axe to grind, you'll never see these things. But let's not pretend that answers are not out there. But check this out. Kitchen then draws on the analogy of Egyptian scriptures. Everybody loves Kemet. So let's let's see how he draws on some, some, some information from Kemet, okay? Like the Karnak Poetica Stella of Tutmos III, the Jebel uh, Barkov Stella and those royal inscriptions on the Uratu uh, that ascribe the defeat of the nation's foe to their patron god, Haldi, and then repeat the same victories and details as achieved by the reigning king of Uratu. Kitchen then adds, <laughs> what is absurd when applied to the monumental Near Eastern text that had... Mm -hmm. No pre no prehistory of hands and redactors should not be imposed on Genesis one. In other words, you won't say the same about these from Kimmon. Why are you saying it about this in Genesis? Mm -hmm. It should not be imposed in Genesis one, Genesis two, as done by an uncritical uh, perpetuation of a nineteenth sister nineteenth uh, century systemization of speculations by 18th century Del <laughs> oh my goodness Delante's lacking as they did all knowledge of the forms and usage of ancient oriental literature in other words your boy Gerald Massey your boy Godfrey Higgins your boy Kersey Graves they they weren't scholars they didn't even look at all of the near eastern literature if they did they wouldn't have made such ridiculous ridiculous and absurd mistakes. He says, as we examine the remainder of Genesis 2, we find that it, it concerns itself with the description and the idea setting forth that God prepared for Adam and Eve to begin their life in, walking in love and fellowship with him as a response, 
There was a responsive and obedient children. Verses five and six describe the original condition of the earth or land in general, in the general region of the Garden of Eden before he had sprouted vendor under the special watering system the Lord had used to develop it. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to put us a bookmarker because we're going to shred this stuff up. Yeah. But just say, uh, just so, you know, just, just to summarize, you better watch yourself because just like Dr. Eric Mason said a few months back, we got receipts. And if you're, you know, if you're if you if you're concerned about truth, if you care about what's truth, you will follow the truth wherever it leads. I got a chance to uh, minister at my job, and of course, I told you, apolog apologetics for me takes place in the barber shop, and it also takes place near that assembly line. Okay. I'm a working young man. I'm also in school, by the way. But it takes place uh, on the assembly line where uh, while I was talking to a gentleman and, you know, he was telling me how he left the faith when he was in high school, all that good stuff. Started listening. Of course, he's he's older than me. He's about 15 years older than me. He, you know, so he's a he's a young man, but, you know, he's older than me. But he's telling me uh, how he left the faith when he was in high school, started talking to some of the nation, uh, you know, cats in the nation of Islam and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we started talking about the Bible and, and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, another friend of mine who is a Christian, he came over just kind of sitting back watching and, it was evident that it really wasn't anything that I could say to the gentleman because I was handling each and every one of his objections. Um, he went as the far to say that the Lord had told, uh, told the Israelites not to be mean to the, uh, the Egyptians because that's, you know, that's who gave them the law. And of course he, he kind of throws out there the what the forty two confessions of Maya or whatever, and I, of course I just simply told him there is a difference between a commandment and a confession and all that good stuff. And uh, if you can't see that, something's up. Of course, I try to keep it cool, keep it nice, keep it humble, because we want this brother to come to the Lord. But there is a difference between a command and a confession. And then on top of that, pointing out to him that governments have laws and uh you know that what do you do about you know the commandment saying that you should have no other gods before yahweh and how the egyptians have a whole pantheon of gods and he wasn't hearing it so he drove you know he he works on uh the you know works in material in other words he brings us our supplies so he drives a tugger so he drove away and my other friend was like dude that brother he wasn't trying to hear it and it was on it was almost demonic in other words the bible talks about us uh tearing down strongholds uh First and foremost, I totally understand that I'm just a tool in the master's hand. My job is not to save anybody. My job is simply to point people to Jesus Christ and tearing down the stronghold, uh, you know, might be tearing down uh, the stronghold so that somebody else can uh, somebody else can come and sow a seed, you know what I mean? And that's a part of apologetics where we uh, we take captive arguments and I like how second Corinthians uh, put it second Corinthians 10 3 through 5 4 uh, and I want to read it in a CSB that's my favorite Bible version uh, or translation if you want to use a little bit more technical term that's my favorite translation oh wrong button not the CEB but the CSB this says, uh, 
It says like this, for although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. And since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful for the demolishment, uh, for the demolition, excuse me, of Strongo, we demolish arguments. Okay. So the brother's arguments were being demolished. Nevertheless, he was still set in his ways. He wasn't trying to hear it. So the very, uh, and let me finish this. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Amen. Amen. So the next day, you know, I saw him and I, and I just flat out asked him. I said, what, I mean, what would it take for you you know, what could be said to cause you to change your mind? What would it take? You know, I was I was trying to show him that he was so deeply wedded to his presuppositions because, you know, he'll come up to me and say, hey, I got a red pill and I got a blue pill for you, blah, blah, blah. And I say, OK, <laughs> by what standard do we measure what is true? And we're getting back to how do we know what's true and what's false? What's our standard? And I always challenge him on the presuppositional level. I like presuppositional apologetics, by the way. They work really well uh, in conversational spaces. Just, you know, just thought I'd mention that. But uh, I, I told him, uh, by what standard do we uh, do we figure out what's true? And, you know, so, I mean, you can have all the pills you want. How do you know what's true? You know what I mean? So... But I told him, I, you know, I was trying to get him to see that he was so stuck in his ways that he's really not as open minded as he would try to have me to be. He's just as uh, he's not neutral. And as the great uh, late Dr. Greg Bonds put it, neither are we. Uh, I'm a professing Christian. Nevertheless, I did tell him that just what Paul said. If Christ is not risen, if he be not raised, we are still, uh, you know, we're still doomed. You know, if, if Christ be not risen, you know, we're going to die. We're still in our sins. So I just flat out told him my faith goes, uh, you know, I have I have an event, you know, that anchors my faith. Mainly the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where. God confirmed every prophecy, every scripture that was written speaking about Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And that's where uh, that's why nobody is left with excuse. God is not hidden. He's not some force that, oh, that, you know, that's just out there and everybody, every culture get to worship them him how he see fit. No, he has spoken and he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And basically what I told him, I said, Jesus Christ, uh, I said, if you can show that Jesus Christ is a fiction beyond a shadow of a doubt and he wasn't real, he didn't get up, he died, didn't do none of what he said. Okay. Then we might have something to talk about. But I said, at least we have something to talk about. I said, you are not open-minded at all. So why you, you can hide and pretend all that good stuff, but you're not. And if the only thing that I was able to do was to pry up his fingers and lift up those fingers just a little bit, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. But anyway, I know that I have kept you guys for a while. Uh, I got a bunch of books on my desk. And maybe I should go digital so y'all won't hear all that good noise. But... I'm kind of old school like that. It's quite all right. Uh, I'm signing off. This is MJ Jackson with the Urban Christian Institute. Y'all, uh, please uh, subscribe to my channel. And uh, I would greatly appreciate if you did. And I, I, I pray to God that this would be uh, edifying and uh, and greatly helpful to you. God bless you all and good night. Tomorrow is Monday. All right, bye-bye.